Welcome to Tom Myers versus the rest of the world. Donald Trump on his Truth Social account advocated for the termination of parts of the Constitution. That word termination is the key because now we know that Trump thinks life begins at conception and ends at 235 years of age. <laughs> the Trump organization was convicted on multiple counts of tax fraud. As punishment, I think the executives involved in that scheme from Donald Trump on down should be forced to live and sleep in the lobby of Trump Tower while enduring New York comics barking, handing out flyers for their comedy shows and recording their podcasts there. While, <laughs> while at the same time, a bachelorette party takes place. Raphael Warnock won his re-election campaign for the U.S. Senate in the Georgia special election this week. The losing candidate, Herschel Walker, gave a speech that night where he didn't actually concede, but he did acknowledge that the campaign was over. It'll be interesting to see his campaign staff not telling him that he lost, but sending him to various strip clubs and just calling it campaigning. Joel <laughs> Greenberg, the former associate of Congressman Matt Gates, was sentenced to 11 years in prison for sex trafficking. The judge would have given him anywhere from 15 to 17 years, but he didn't want Greenberg to hear 15 to 17 years and pop a heart on in court. <laughs> Marjorie Taylor Greene recently said masks don't work against COVID because really thick underwear doesn't prevent people from smelling farts. That statement alone means that Marjorie Taylor Greene knows as much about COVID as Jim Jordan knows about reporting teenage sexual assault. <laughs> the big island of hawaii has an active volcano that is spewing lava and shutting down major roads on the island something like that would affect people in say my home state of maryland differently than in hawaii if a lava flow ever shut down roads in maryland my neighbors would be calling their local government going yeah this isn't gonna fuck up my trash pickup is it yeah <laughs> New York City's famed Caroline's Comedy Club is closing its doors after 40 years. This is a victory for incels who say that comedians who perform at a club with a woman's name aren't funny. <laughs> <laughs> and now on with the show. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Heisen and Abby Mello. Hello. Hey, Tom. Jeff, Abby, welcome. Uh, Tom, it's name? great to be back. I, yes. uh, I'm uh, for the loyal fans. I'm not back full time, but I'm very excited to have been on the previous episode and to be here again and to see Jeff and Tom and our other lovely guests this evening. So this is going to be really exciting. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what's uh, what have you guys been up to this week? Well, Tom, I want to give you credit for helping Senator Warnock get reelected because if about he... time, you know, okay. it's he had a commercial where. He had Atlantans, Atlanteans, Georgians, let's say Georgians. There we go. <laughs> watch videos of Herschel Walker speak and then comment on it, which is basically the format of this show. And they, the, the Georgians would watch Walker express disbelief and say something uh, and about Walker's uh, comments. That's what we do. So they took this format and wrote it to victory. Well done, Tom. Oh, well, I have to say that I volunteered for a U.S. Senate campaign years ago, and that didn't parlay into employment. So I'm not holding out hope that I'll uh, I'll have a new job come January. But you and I know. And then all the all the Patreon mm -hmm. listeners as well. <laughs> I don't, I don't need a government job with all this Patreon money rolling in. <laughs> I'm not much into soccer. In fact, most games put me right to sleep, much like all of your podcasts on which you try and have me as a guest. It's simple. Jesus. Stop it's trying to convert me into soccer and stop getting me on your podcast, especially if it's about soccer. <laughs> the fact that the time difference with the games being played in the Middle East means some games in this country are simulcast in the mornings and early afternoons means American sports fans finally have an excuse to drink during the daytime. Only joking, of course, American sports fans never needed an excuse. <laughs> and joining us tonight to go ahead and discuss this year's <laughs> World Cup, please welcome Valerie Pascal and Greg Kay. Hey. hey, thanks so much for having me. 
Absolutely. Welcome to the show. Um, yeah. Valerie, Greg, I understand you're big uh, World Cup folks or soccer oh, yeah. soccer fans. Soccer uh, fans. What was your take on this year's what was your take on this year's World Cup? Well, <laughs> I mean, it's got a big old um, asterisk for yeah. human rights next to it. So sure. ignoring the 6,500 dead bodies that it was built on, the cup's been going fantastically. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I That's I, the I level of optimism we try and get on this show, which <laughs> I, I love that. <laughs> I agree with the sentiment uh, wholeheartedly. The you know giant asterisk behind the um, behind the tournament itself, but I, you know I don't know. I'm a sucker for for soccer in general. I love. I actually watch the English Premier League soccer. Uh, you know when it's on. You know during the during the year, which the World Cup unprecedentedly in, uh, unprecedentedly interrupted because it's moved to November, which is right in the dead center of the the Premier League and most European club league seasons. But uh. Yeah, so I mean, it's been a great, great tournament um, because it's always been fun to watch, and you know, I can watch a little bit while I while I work from home. But uh, other than that, and all of the human rights violations and and uh, controversy surrounding it being in uh, Qatar has been a, has been really kind of a stain on it overall. In addition to the background about the teams and the stats, every World Cup features some kind of underlying social issue. This year, with Iran's entry, it was about their treatment of women and some of the players on Team USA, such as Tyler Adams in this clip, are ready with responses about their criticisms of Iran's governmental policies. Pilot, this question is for you. My name is Mila Javamardi from Press TV. First of all, you say you support the Iranian people, but you're pronouncing our country's name wrong. Our country is named Iran, not Iran. Please, once and for all, let's get this clear. Second of all, um, are you okay to be representing a country that has so much discrimination against black people in its own borders? And uh, we saw the Black Lives Matter movement uh, over the past few years. Are you okay to be representing the US? Meanwhile, there's so much discrimination happening against black people in America. My apologies on uh, the mispronunciation of your country. Um, yeah, that being said, you know, there's discrimination uh, everywhere you go. Um, you know, one thing that I've learned, especially from living abroad in the past years and uh, having to fit in in different cultures and, and kind of assimilate into different cultures, um, is that in the U.S. we're, we're continuing to make progress uh, every single day. You know, growing up for me, I was I, I grew up in a in a white family with an obviously an African American heritage and background as well. So um, I had a little bit of uh, different cultures, and I, I was very very easily able to assimilate in different different cultures. So um, you know, not everyone has that that ease and uh, the ability to do that. And obviously, it takes longer to understand. And through education, I think it's it's super important. Like you just educated me now on the pronunciation of of your country. So. Um, um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a process. I think as, as long as you see progress, uh, that's the most important thing. I mean, I thought that was an awesome response, but given like the way that the way that that reporter uh, came at him, it's like with all the stuff they've done, it was the pronunciation of the country's name that, that they got upset. It would be like, you know, if, if I was a serial killer, that's a stretch, I know. And I went into court. <laughs> And I was upset because they kept misspelling my surname in the papers. No, I agree with you. I think his response was just was perfect. Uh, and, you know, the the um, the reporter was clearly trying to bait him into into saying something, you know, maybe a little off the cuff or, you know, but he, you know, he was measured in his response. He he, you know, apologized. First thing he did was apologize for pronouncing the, the you know, the country's name wrong. And, I mean, that shows contrition and I don't know, it shows a lot of maturity for, for somebody so young. So yeah. yeah, I thought, I thought that was just as good of a response as you can possibly have. And he's not wrong. I mean, you know, he, everywhere you look, we kind of talked to, talked about this a little earlier, just like everywhere you look, every, every sport, there's going to be some kind of issue that, uh, that needs, you know, somebody's going to have to, uh, uh, address. And so he did a, a, I think a fantastic job doing that. You know, if he said, I see the ball, I kick the ball. And if mistakes were made, do you know how hard the ball is when it hits my head? <laughs> uh, and that would have been a satisfactory answer, but he went above and beyond there. And uh, and I, I don't know if he was prepped for that, but well done. There's no way he was prepped for that because that was a gotcha question. And in the yeah. middle of that, 
question, the second bit about, well, what about America and the discrimination? You can see the New York in his eyes just switch on and go, oh, you're trying to trap me. I see what you're right. doing. And that man is 23 years old, 23, yep. and he's giving those answers. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know men who are 23 years old because they do comedy they can barely brush their teeth <laughs> <laughs> and no, he's like it, yeah. avoiding a political he's avoiding a geopolitical disaster it yeah. was also a really great sidestep because he didn't say his answer wasn't i love america and i you know like i'm proud to be from there and you know like he didn't like he didn't take the bait um and he also didn't throw America under the bus. He had a very measured answer based on his life experiences that, and also subtly twisted the knife about as, I mean, the final sentence was something along the lines of as long as you're seeing progress, that's what matters, which is a, which is a stab at Iran, obviously, because mm -hmm. they are moving backwards. So mm -hmm. it was both diplomatic, didn't throw anybody under the bus, was, you know, slightly patriotic and was like, I'm going to use your own words against you or your own concept mm -hmm. against you. It was really, it was brilliant. You couldn't have scripted it. And it's, it's so smart, especially because I've seen the camera cut to him on the field. It's very different, very different what you see coming out of his mouth once he started playing. <laughs> <laughs> In this international report, we learn of a former Iran player arrested for having the gall to criticize anything about his home country. Iran has arrested one of the country's most famous footballers, Voria Ghafouri, accusing him of spreading prof propaganda. This comes amid anti-state protests that have rocked the country and also cast a long shadow on the ongoing FIFA World Cup in Qatar. 35-year-old Ghafour has been a vocal critic of the ruling dispensation in Iran. He was reportedly arrested after a training session with his football club on charges of, quote-unquote, insulting the national football team and speaking against the regime. He recently expressed sympathy for the family of 22-year-old Masa Amini, whose death while in the custody of Iran's morality police in the month of September ignited massive protests across Iran. Ghafori was a member of Iran's 2018 World Cup squad but wasn't selected for the 2022 Qatar World Cup. His arrest comes just days after the Iranian football team used the global stage to make a powerful protest against their regime. The team refused to sing the national anthem ahead of their second match against Wales. But their fans still protested inside the stadium against the regime back home with flags and jerseys which were later confiscated by the police. The western Kurdish region of Iran, where both Amini and Ghafouri are from, has been the epicenter of these protests. I mean, the idea of being arrested for criticizing a team like being a Baltimore sports fan, that that's a foreign concept to us. Like <laughs> something like that happening, like that's worse than like the government trying to take away our guns like that idea. Ooh, yeah, that's not something that and I'm used to criticizing. Well, and he's criticizing um, the government, which like, I'm sorry. But I know a lot of these guys on at least a couple of these guys on the U.S. men's team wore like George Floyd protests around those times when they were still playing in games overseas for a gigantic COVID audience of nobody. With the USA officially out, American soccer fans can turn their attention to the Women's World Cup scheduled to take place next July and August in Australia and New Zealand. Although the collective bargaining agreement reached means the men's and women's teams will have an equal share of the other's prize money, it is still a subject for debate, as this clip of a discussion between CNN's morning anchors shows us. So the men's 2020 World Cup total prize money is $440 million. Compare that to the women's 2019 World Cup total prize money, it's just $30 million. So essentially, the women get to split a larger part of a much larger Hi, that is what's going on here. But Harry, the women's team has been more successful than the men's team. It's been far more successful. So just because something makes more money doesn't necessarily mean it's necessarily better, right? So if we look historically speaking, the women's World Cup titles, they have won four since 1991. The men's World Cup titles, they've won zero 
zero since 1930. So yes, the men's, are, men's tournament brings in more money, but when it comes to the U.S., I'd make the argument that the women's, the women's team is far more responsible for the boost in popularity. And All right, I would I make the exact opposite argument. I know everyone's going to hate me. Go ahead. But Dan. the men's team makes more money. Hey. If they make more money, then they should get more Here's money. Why is the, the men's, men's team, team? The men's team makes more money because you know men, why? because people are more interested. But in he, guess who takes blank, part of blank? I have a big issue with this, guys. WNBA, same things happening to them. There's Until also media, more interest in, in the hold NBA, on, hold though. on, hold on, huh? Until big media companies, big tech companies, advertisers invest. And put them on their airwaves more, and allow people. No, 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 and allow people to see it more and gain more fans. Then you will push toward more equality. Okay. But if they are blocked in so many ways and not invested in as you much, are, they I'm don't even sexist. have a. They, I know you're I not, grew but they up don't the even only have a shot. Boy in, a, in a family of all women, I understand what you're saying, but not everybody, honestly, has the same skill. Not everybody has the same interest in the sport. I think the women should be paid more. I do. But if the but men, the, you're right that not everyone has the same skills because yeah. the women are better skilled. Well, the women are better skilled against other job, women. The, but if the women played the men, why, they wouldn't what? be winning the way well, that they what? win. Okay, I'm not going right? to get into. So, I'm not I'm even going to get into that argument. Just, there's more interest in the men simply because it is what it is. Wait, wait, I, mean, I don't. Wait. I don't. Do you want to finish your point, or you want to move? No, on? she's okay, trying I'm to talking move to Caitlin. On. I actually would like to move on because Let's I think on. we have a lot of news to get Let's to. Let's get to the this news. Is very, this is a very Thank important conversation, I think. It's, you know, it's about the dollars. That guy at the board was just like, do not look at me to be your wingman. I'm not helping you out of this one. Who, who yeah. was that fake uh, Steve Kornacki at the board? <laughs> I just, I, I just, I just really like the way he says years, 1900 and 90, 1991, 1900. Yeah. I think we should start elongating Sorry. how we pronounce this. This is 2022. <laughs> I think we should just start throwing random ands in the middle of our in the year of whatever <laughs> deity in which you worship, 1100. <laughs> I think that the, the the male anchor's argument amounted to like you know I have so many friends who are women you know what I mean like my, <laughs> my, I, I have a I have a mom who's a woman you know she's such a she's a woman and I'm fr I'm a, I'm fr I'm good I'm good with that that's cool women are cool. I love Yay, that he women. quite literally after <laughs> five times interrupted a woman to to say that he was not sexist and because he was the only man in his family I'm ju I just excuse me I just want to interrupt you to to say. I am not sexist. I uh, am, in fact, the only person with a penis in my family. What do you think about that? <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure so his sexist. sisters love him right now. Right. <laughs> Either way, um, I think with all these controversies, it's a. I think it's kind of good that the USA is finally uh, is out of the shit show now. <laughs> it's small blessing in disguise. Yeah, now people from other countries can uh, get kicked out of stadiums for having rainbows on their T-shirts. <laughs> and that's it for the first half of this episode. My thanks to Valerie and Greg. Thank you Thank so you. much. Appreciate it. Yeah. The holiday season reminds us, especially those in the artistic community, that it, that, it is our, that it is our own damn faults that we feel too pressured to spend money we don't have to live up to a consumerist culture that markets us into near bankruptcy for the sole purpose of helping to spread artificial joy in the form of holiday greetings to others. Now, with this upcoming segment, I hate to bring an air of cynicism, negativity, and lack of hope to this podcast, but how else would I get people to listen? <laughs> Joining us tonight to go ahead and discuss marketing consumerism, please welcome back to the show, Joe Gorman. Hey, everyone. How are you doing? Joe, welcome back to the show. Um, are you excited about the holiday season coming up? Are you excited about uh, getting bombarded with advertising and the need to go out and spend money? It was uh, the holidays were a lot more fun when you're a kid and all you have to do is write a letter to Santa, you know, and maybe put out some milk and cookies. Now, as an adult, it's like, you know, you got to buy presents for everyone. You got to coordinate holiday travel. You got to request time off from work and you got to write a letter to Santa, man. It's just a uh, there's just too much to do. <laughs> Not enough hours in the day. We're almost there. It's almost Christmas time. I know. I mean, it's very difficult. Like I, I find like a lot of other podcasts, like they, 
they, they get advertisers approaching them. And like, I would think that would be like a mixed blessing just because like the kind of content I do, like doesn't necessarily translate well to the market of some of the, uh, of some of the products that usually advertise on comedy podcasts. Like, like imagine like me finishing up with that rant I just did and then have to do an ad read for a penis enlargement supplement or, or manscaped. Like I do one of these rants and they say, and you know what else I hate? The fact that there's too much hair around my junk. Use promo code Myers for like, I would, I, I, I don't know that I, that wouldn't translate well. I don't think. Well, we don't know that. I mean, like uh, it's the holiday season. You know, I think like the last thing you're, you know, well, that's actually the perfect stocking stuffer is a manscape thing. You should, Tom, you should reevaluate that, man. That, that's great. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's the holiday season. The last thing you want to do is make sure grandpa has a, has a hairy bush when he's hanging out and at the, at the retirement hall, you know, he's got to look his best, man. Just cause <laughs> yeah, why not? So Tom, Tom, you might be onto something, man. Tom, you would turn down an ED ad. I mean, I am going to be 40 next year, so not entirely. <laughs> I love that you say next year when it's literally like three weeks into next year. <laughs> I'm, I'm prolonging the inevitable. Uh, I'm next week, man. <laughs> We're right there. We're like a month apart. Yeah. The potential for companies and individuals to make money keeps increasing, and the creation of social media has allowed for more get-rich-quick opportunities to try to flourish as this video advertising a Facebook group shows us. I found my treasure. I found my treasure. I found my treasure. I found my treasure. I found all my treasures at JB's Fantastic Finds. Discover your treasure on JB's Fantastic Finds. Where the worlds of myth and fantasy collide with jewelry. Such a deal. The show is amazing. Sold, sold, sold. Sold, sold, sold. Sold, sold, sold. sold. Watch JB's Fantastic Finds with John Bastow to discover your treasure. Treasure hunting in the world with men and fantasy collide. Come explore all the secrets of JB's Fantastic Finds. Like, I'm not sure highlighting your Facebook group is the best way to go about like selling stuff like, yeah, come over here on Facebook where I'm selling this shit because no one else will, no one else will help pocket for me. What were they yeah. selling stuff you find on the side of the road? You got to give props to them because at least like it looked like actual people on Facebook that would use that Facebook marketplace. <laughs> it wasn't like paid actors like those are absolutely the people that you would meet buying and selling and haggling with on Facebook marketplace. So props to Mark Zuckerberg a multi-billionaire who uh, is able to have such a, such an illustrious thing. These, I like how they made it kind of like a knockoff QVC too. the way they presented everything. Just all like the crap perfectly presented in a way that's like, and if you act now, we'll throw in another useless piece of crap for just a yeah. little bit more. I have a now deceased uh, grandmother who we called uh, jewelry TV grandma, because that's basically all she did was watch jewelry TV and QVC and buy this stuff and save it for nine months until it was a birthday or a you know holiday that she could give it to us. Um, yeah, I, I also I definitely thought they were going down the multi-level marketing scheme thing here, because that's actually what a lot of the Facebook when they go like Facebook live and do those like that, that exact thing that they just did. It's often in a multi-level marketing scheme. So they're trying to get you to buy the stuff and then tell you how much you can make selling it on Facebook Marketplace. Um, but that seemed like a, a direct-to-consumer garbage train. The classic component of any advertising is a jingle. And in this piece, an ad for a pain reliever uses a familiar and somewhat appropriate tune to drive home the point that pain in one's body is inevitable. If pain's ailing you and relief's overdue, Buy Hembana, the number one hemp pain relief brand in America. Available now in stores everywhere. Like the fact that they would use the happy birthday song, like the idea of getting older is stressful enough, but to go ahead and have that, to go ahead and have that as an ad for a pain relief song or for a pain relief ad, like that concept offends even me. Everyone just found out that that song isn't actually in the public domain, so we can use it. Like for the longest time, we thought we had to pay like some person uh, copyright over it. And that's why every restaurant had a goofy happy birthday to you song. 
we're finally reclaiming the happy birthday song. I want to hear it. In there. That should be at least 14 of the top 40 songs in America <laughs> right now. Like, come on. Let's see what we can do. We got, we got, we got a, a theme, man. We're always remixing the beats. That's what makes America so fun. We, we only need like a handful of tunes to be entertained for decades. I think happy birthday to you theme. I think it's, it's going places, especially in 2023. For years, it has seemed that companies have been making decisions about product development and marketing without any consideration for the wishes of the consumer. In this YouTube video, a man takes to the platform to express his dismay about the cancellation of his favorite alcoholic beverage. Y'all wanted a rant. All right, I got something good to rant about now. Budweiser, in its infinite wisdom, decided to stop making but dry period forever all i got to say is y'all's marketing department sucks it fucking sucks boy if you was in charge of marketing why didn't you market it better to where it sell better i drink it there's a whole website devoted to but dry and why is it gone what's wrong with you fucking people God damn it, I'm pissed off to the highest level of pissedivity, boy. I hope your head falls off. The little one first, and then the big one. Then oh. we just play basketball with, with them. It's the, the big head anyway. They kick the fuck out of it. Non-union bunch of motherfuckers. Yeah, I was loyal to Anheuser Bush. And what did I get? A slap in the goddamn face. You non-union bunch of motherfuckers are right, choked the piss out of you. Oh, and have yourself a merry little Christmas, boy. <laughs> like, I've seen yes. people who just caught their spouses cheating on them who weren't as upset as that. <laughs> yeah. I really like that he is 100% confident that the beer is exquisite. And it's the fault of the marketing. There's no other reason. It's not the rise of craft beers or different types of beers, or maybe this beer isn't as good as that beer, or maybe Budweiser is trying to uh, cut back on the number of brands, which happens. No, it was the marketing that that shows confidence in and the, the lack of and the lack of unions, Jeff. Yes, yeah, that's put the blame where the blame is due. Yeah. Marketing lack. I love of that unions. he's yeah. I love that he's pro union. Of, uh, of course, he loves an American beer like Budweiser. That's a, it's a, that's Amer as, 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 that's as American as protesting an American beer is, is that being upset that they're discontinuing Budweiser dry. In conclusion, we can all become disillusioned with the holiday season because of the intense consumerism and commercialization of the event being displayed to the point where it seems all hope is lost, resulting in actions that my legal counsel tells me I shouldn't mention on a recorded podcast if I want to avoid any visits from the Maryland State Police or the Secret Service. Well, on my way to a holiday party this week, I stopped at an intersection and saw a couple who looked down on their luck bickering and fighting. At its most tense, I got up out of my vehicle and handed them coupons I keep in my car for sandwiches, drinks, and basic essentials. The couple were so thrilled that they simultaneously gave each other hand jobs right there at the intersection. So in this story, I got two happy endings for the price of one. When it comes to holiday shopping, there are bargains everywhere. Anyway, I'm off now. I'm on my way to my local senior center to go spread some holiday cheer. I'm taking gifts, snacks, companionship, and, of course, the essential for any fun get-together, methamphetamines. So these old folks can really party late into the night and maybe even stay up past 930. And on that note, that's our show. I want to thank Jeff Heisen, Abby Mello, Joe Gorman, Valerie Pascal, and Greg Kay. Ooh, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. This episode was written and hosted by Tom Myers with panelists Jeff Heisen and Abby Mello and guests Valerie Pascal, Greg Kay, and Joe Gorman. Theme music composed and arranged by Jeroen Vandenherrick. Executive Producers, Tom Myers, Matt Connerton for IPM Nation, and Eddie Carson for Odyssey Radio. Please leave a five-star rating and a positive review on Apple Podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast's Patreon for extended episodes, bonus clips, and more. 
Thank you for listening, and please visit tommyers.us. Thank you.